Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Uh, g- glory to God. Well, it feels good to be back in the pulpit. It's been a few weeks. And uh, Pastor Dave and Teen Challenge and Pastor Carl uh, last week brought the heat. Okay, that's a baseball term, sorry. But uh, they brought the heat the last two weeks, and uh, praise God. I, I appreciate them uh, preaching up a storm, and uh, God has many, many messengers, right? Hallelujah. Praise God, and thank you, Jesus, for that, and praise the Lord. All right, well, today, I'll warn you up front, this is not your typical Christmas message. Um, that I've, I've never preached this, I don't think, and I don't know if I've ever heard one quite like this before. Maybe I have, but it's, if it has, it's been a while. Um, but uh, it's going to be a little bit different, and that's okay. Um, there are so many people today that say that this book is, is, is you know, they think it's outdated, it's antiquated, it's, it's, uh, they don't even care about it, they don't have any respect for it. They think it has no revel, revelance, re, relevance for today. There we go. They think it has no relevance for today. That it was written by a a bunch of men and it is interpreted differently by different people. So it's like you can't, you know, you can't depend on this book, they would say. But I find it interesting that usually those who say those things, they themselves are not students of the word. They themselves are not probably been in the word recently. They come against it having not opened it or open it anytime soon. And uh, maybe in recent years. And so, because uh, when you do open it, it has a way of changing you. It has a way of getting in here and doing something in your spirit. Yeah, I was reading something this week and it just came alive to me. It's funny, it was funny because I was reading it out of a different, uh, my little Bible in the car and it wasn't NIV. And I was like, I never saw that verse like that. And it's just, God was just showing me something really cool in it. And I was just like, wow. And uh, so allow God to just take this word and implant it in your heart and do something good in you. Amen. But today we celebrate the birth of our Savior, although we realize this is not the day of the year, most likely, of course, that he was born. Most scholars would say that he was born in the spring, in April probably. Um, What day of the year, though, is not as nearly as important as the fact that he was born of a virgin, right? And that he was crucified and he rose again about 33 years later, right? So if you stand in honor of God's word, if you can, and turn to Matthew chapter 1, We'll arrive there shortly, I'm telling you, sooner or later. And the title of my message this morning is Prophecies Fulfilled. Scholars believe that there are over 300 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. Think about that, 300 prophecies. That is a lot of prophecies over a long period of time. I know what some of you are thinking. Is he going to go over all 300 this morning? Call the kids, tell them we won't be over today. In fact, we won't be over the rest of the year if he does that. All right, let me put you at ease on this Christmas morning. I'm only going to go over eight of those prophecies. So let's go to Matthew chapter chapter 1, starting with verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Emmanuel. God with us. Lord, wherever we go as Christians, God with us, Emmanuel. He's there. He's there in the grocery store. He's there when the flat tire, the tire goes flat. He's there in, uh, on Tuesday afternoon at work when things aren't going well. He's there on Sunday night when we're just lonely maybe and looking for a friend. Lord, you're there the whole time, all the time, everywhere and every place we go with us. And Lord, we thank you for that. May we truly experience a Christmas this year where we know that God is Emmanuel with us. 
In Jesus' mighty name. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 As you're seated, tell someone, unto us a child is born. Amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah. So, to those who say this book, our Bible is an old-fashioned, outdated book, I'll give them this. It is old. It's got a lot of years on it, right? It is old. It was written over 6,000 years ago, some of it, right? But to say it's antiquated, in other words, it's discredited because of its age, no longer useful is a completely different story. When I'm done with this message, I hope you'll see that that thought could be no further from the truth. And that brings me to my first point this morning, and it's this. Number one, prophecies fulfilled are living proof God's word is true. Amen. Prophecies fulfilled are living proof God's word is true. Yeah. Jesus' birth testifies of that very thing. The lineage of Jesus was planned long ago and is impeccable. As we read about in chapter 1 of Matthew, in the, in the genealogy of Jesus, there were 14 generations, of course, from Abraham to David, David to the exile in Babylon, 14 generations from the exile in Babylon to Christ. Hallelujah. In the first 17 verses of Matthew chapter 1, 46 people are mentioned spanning 2,000 years. Church, all of these 14s are not coincidental, coincident or by accident. Hallelujah. Did I say David? I might have missed David in there. But anyway, Abraham to David, David to the exile, exile to Christ. I don't know if I said all those, but that's what it is. And it's not, it's, it's not, it's not coincidental or by accident. And the first uh, three people mentioned in Jesus' lineage were told that the nations will be blessed. Through Abraham's lineage, God tells Abram in Genesis 12, 2 and 3, that he will make... You, he'll make you into a great nation. I will bless you, he said to him. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you, right? And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Wow, through him. That's great. We see the fulfillment of this. As Peter is speaking to the Israelites in Acts, he states, And you are heirs of the prophets, and of the covenant God made with his fathers. He said to Abraham, Through your offspring all people on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad God sent uh, to turn us from our wicked ways? He sent his servant. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. A few chapters later in Genesis, God established his covenant with Isaac's ancestors. Genesis 17, 19, God tells Abraham, your wife Sarah will, will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. Of course, we know that means laughter. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. We see the fulfillment of that in Paul's letter to the Romans, Romans chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Nor, because they are his descendants, are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. So Abraham, Isaac, and now let's go to Genesis chapter 28, starting with verse 12. It should be up on your screen. It continues on with the next generation as Jacob has a dream at Bethel. In his dream, he sees a stairway. This is a really cool dream. He sees a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to the heavens. Can you imagine that? And the angels of God are descending and ascending on it. Think about that. You've got the staircase to heaven. The angels of God are coming down and they're going back up. They're ascending and ascending. How cool is that? There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. All the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. 
Wow, what a, what a promise, amen? amen? What a promise. Yes. Well, we see this fulfilled in Luke chapter 3, verses 34, in the baptism and genealogy of Jesus, where it states the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. God's covenant promise to Abraham and Isaac was offered to Jacob as well. See, it's not enough to be Abraham's grandson. Jacob had to establish his own personal relationship with God. See, Israel, the nation, would come from Abraham. Through Abraham's family tree, Christ was born to save humanity. Through Christ, we can have our own personal relationship with Jesus. We can't get there on our, the coattails of grandpappy and grandpappy's pappy and grandpappy's mammy and mammy's grandpappy and granny and grandma. We can't get there on that. It's got to be personal. It's got to be right here. It's got to be for us. We have to receive it. Well, I grew up in the church. Yeah, that doesn't make you a Christian. Well, I'm a pretty good guy. No, you're not, but the Scripture says, but that doesn't make you a Christian, okay? Amen. Our righteousness is like filthy rags, the Bible says, right? There's no, they're not one good, as I read my scriptures, right? I go to church every Sunday. Well, your good works are not going to do it. I'm sorry. You're not going to get there. You've got to do it on your own. You've got to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior on your own. And so it's, it comes to each one of us because when we stand before God, it's not going to be like, hey, hey, yeah, uh, you know, I was there when I was 10 and 12 at church, even though I wasn't paying attention, even though I hated it. I was there, and so aren't I in good, God? No, 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 no. You need to have it in your own heart, Jesus. You need to accept him in your own heart, in your own life as your Savior. You can't say, you can't stand on all these things because here's the thing. When we, when we get to heaven, we're going to have to answer for ourselves. Nobody else. Nobody else, just ourselves we're going to have to answer to. That's it. So, so we need to become part of God's lineage and his story for us and for ourselves. Jesus' birth and his lineage is no accident. Nothing in the Bible is an accident. Amen. Nothing in the Bible is quinky dink, as I call it, or coincidence. Amen. So if you hear noises, it's just the heater. I was here Friday and I thought, who are all these people running around this building? It's just the heater bopping through. So if you hear this, boop, 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 that's what that is, just so you know. I know people are looking like, what's that noise? Or, yeah, who knows, right? God shows up. Hallelujah. Amen. Was, amen. Do it, Lord. So <laughs> it was, so was premeditated by, pre by God the Father. Uh, he had us in mind all along. God's not like, uh-oh, what am I going to do now? God doesn't wake up one day and go, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. I don't think God gets in trouble. He knows what's going on. He's aware of all of it. The beginning to the end, the, in, in, in the middle and everything in between. He knows your yesterdays, he knows your todays, and he knows your tomorrows. Isn't that a good thing to think of? He knows everything that's coming up. So if you're wondering and you're worried, stop worrying and wondering and just go to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He knows what's there tomorrow. Hallelujah. He knows what tomorrow holds, and thank you, Jesus, for that. Hallelujah. He knew there would be all this snow this week. He, he wasn't, it wasn't a shocker to him. You know, sometimes I love it when this happens because it slows everybody down. And you know what? It shows that God's in control. Man's not in control. When this stuff happens, it changes everybody's life. Well, that's because you're not really ultimately running your life. He's running the show. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So also, though, the scepter would also come through Judah. In Genesis 49.10 states, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs and the obedience of the nations is his. Amen. Think about that. The obedience of the nations is his. You're probably wondering, what's under this towel? What is this thing he's got here? Has he got somebody buried? No, I don't have somebody buried. I don't have somebody buried. What do you think this is? Upside down J. It's a little staff, isn't it? Right? Hallelujah. See, the scepter was basically a staff or a rod. It was a symbol of authority. And it came from the idea that the ruler was like a shepherd to his people. We also see this fulfilled in Luke 3, uh, verse 33. The son of Aminadab, I like that name, Aminadab. I should have named my kids that, Aminadab. The son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah. And David's offspring will also have an eternal kingdom. The author in, in, uh, of 2 Samuel chapter 7, he said halfway through verse 11, he said this, addressing David, and he said, The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you, 
when your days are over and you, and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, succeed you and who will come from your own body. I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And of course we know his son, King Solomon, that to be King Solomon. But we see this prophecy fulfilled on the first verse in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. And it says this, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. As I talked about earlier, the first 17 verses of that chapter go on to state the genealogy of Jesus. Pastor, what on earth does all this have to do with Christmas and the baby Jesus born in a manger to Joseph and Mary? Everything. For starters, Joseph and David were both descendants, uh, Joseph and Mary, excuse me, were descendants of David. God kept and still keeps his promises all through the 6,000 years of recorded Bible history and prophecy. Aren't you thankful for that? We serve a faithful God. See, the whole Bible is the inspired Word of God. But today, man would like to say, well, you know, some of it's inspired and some of it's not. Well, who gets to choose that? Who gets to st- decide what's inspired and what's not? I guess if you do that, you put yourself in God's place, don't you? Yeah. Amen. You're like, well, I, you know, this is inspired and this isn't, and we don't need the Old Testament. That, Oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute. 300 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament, and we don't need the Old Testament? We're going to throw that out the door? Because we're in grace now. We don't need the law. We don't need anything with the Old Testament. Oh, baby, it all fits together. Trust me. It all fits together. It all flows. Hallelujah. But not only that, but for thousands of years, God had a plan to save you and save me from our sin. And that plan showed up lying in a manger in the town of Bethlehem over 2,000 years ago. All I can say once again is, wow. Any way you spell it, it's wow. W-O-W. At this point, praise God. That's all I can say. Thank you, Jesus. See, our Father is all about relationship, and he's been thinking about restoration with his children since the fall of Adam and Eve, even before that. He knew that they would sin and that we would need a way out from the curse of sin, right? And that way out was Jesus. There's no death and resurrection without a birth. In Bethlehem. No death, no resurrection, unless he's born in Bethlehem. But not only are prophecies fulfilled, proof that God's word is true, but secondly, prophecies fulfilled prove that Jesus is the Messiah. Roughly 700 years before Christ's birth, the prophet Isaiah stated in chapter 7, verse 14, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and you will call him Emmanuel. We see the fulfillment of that prophecy in Luke 1.35 when the angel Gabriel visits Mary and tells her she will have a son and he is to be named Jesus. Mary questions Gabriel asking, how, how can this be? I'm a virgin, which is a great question, of course. Gabriel replies, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Not only was his birth prophesied, but also where he would be born. The prophet Micah wrote it some 725 years before Christ was born. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it states this, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, another name for Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, Out of you will come for me one who will rule over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. We see this prophecy fulfilled in Matthew chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. When he, talking about King Herod, had called together all the people, people's chief priest and the teacher of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. 
some, what, 700, did I say, 725 years before he was born? Folks, this is hundreds of years have gone by. This is predicted hundreds of years before. Some of these go farther than that, thousands. It was prophesied long before that the Messiah would come and be born in Bethlehem, but he, that also that he would end up in Egypt. Over 700 years before Christ's birth, the prophet Hosea, questioning God, stated in chapter 11, verse 1, he says this, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. We see this prophecy fulfilled in Matthew 2, starting with verse 13. And when they, the wise men, had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up! He said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Of course, he made it look like he wanted to worship him, but we know Herod had a long nose and it was growing, right? So he got up and he took the child and his son, mother, and and his son, uh, his mother, excuse me, during the night and left for Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said to the, to the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Folks, this is incredible. All these things that were prophesied all these years earlier. It's just God. No man can do any of this. No man can prophesy this way back in 1400 and say, okay, in 2022, 20, Pastor Ken's going to be standing up there with a staff and he's going to be preaching the word of God at New Horizon. I mean... You know what I'm saying? I mean, yes, there's prophecies, but to have these things happen hundreds and hundreds of years later is unbelievable. It's God. I have, so I've shared eight prophecies with you this morning from the Old Testament that were fulfilled hundreds and some thousands of years later. And these prophecies are so specific that the chances of Jesus fulfilling even a few of these is, in, is improbable, if not impossible. The possibility of anyone satisfying even these eight prophecies that I just shared with you this morning is one in ten to the 17th power. Now, some of you that are smart in math, like probably early, he's going, oh, I know what that is right away. Some of you guys are figuring that out right away. I don't even know what that means. Algebra, you can throw it out. I couldn't do good in algebra no matter what. For my, I could despair my teeth. One, one in ten was good enough for me. You know, That's as far as I could go. But if you take 10 tickets and put them in, the, in a hat and stir them up and ask a blindfolded man to draw one out, what is his chances of getting that right? One in 10, right? One ten. So 10 people, you're going to get one that's going to do it. Not bad. But 10 to the 17th power is equivalent to taking silver dollars and laying them all over Texas two feet deep, mark one of them, stir them all up, and spread them all over the state of Texas, blindfold a man or a woman, tell him to go and pick out the one that is marked. What are your chances of finding that one? Good luck with that one, right? We don't believe in luck, but you know what I'm saying. Good luck with that one, right? What do you think your chances of getting that right are? If, the, if these prophets wrote these prophecies in their own wisdom, that would be the chance that prophets would have had of getting these eight prophecies right and having them all come true in any, any, any man from, from when they were written until now. But these people didn't write these prophecies down out of their own wisdom. Instead, they wrote them down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God has given this wisdom to men all these years. Why? Because We serve an awesome God, church, who has each one of us in mind even before the fall of man. And because his love for us and his desire for us is to spend eternity with him. Think about it. The God who created the universe was thinking about you. He was thinking about me when he sent his son to us to later die on a cross for our sins. And then he would rise from the dead. The greatest gift you can ever receive on this Christmas or any other time of the year is salvation. And that only comes through Jesus Christ. He is the Savior of the world. And uh, he would provide that 33 years later as he would go to that cross for you on your behalf. And so if you're watching this maybe by video or maybe 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 it's Christmas week, but maybe it's long after and uh, you're watching this, all you have to do is receive the greatest gift given to mankind, and that is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You, the Lord is the great shepherd, 
And uh, he can lead and guide us. He does lead us and guide us. And so as you come to Jesus Christ, the great shepherd wants to, you to come to him and then he wants to lead and guide you the rest of his life. It's not just about one time accepting Christ, although that's very important that you accept Jesus as your Savior. But it's about allowing him to, be your, allowing him to have lordship of your life, be your leader every single day. Give your life to the good shepherd and let him lead you. He will lead you. When you get a little off, he'll say, come on, come on over here. Come on over here. He'll guide you and he'll lead you through life. Is, life, is there storms in life right now? Give it to the good shepherd. Because we are his sheep and he will take us where we need to go. Hallelujah. And if that's you this morning and, or whenever you're watching this, and just click on our playlist entitled More About a Personal Relationship with Jesus Christ, and that'll lead you through the process. We want to get a book in your hand called Brand New. It'll help you walk with Jesus for the next 31 days. And let us know about that. We want to rejoice with you because all heaven will be rejoicing as well. Amen. Praise God. So, Father, we just thank you. And I, I just thank you, Lord, for your son again. I thank you for Jesus Christ. And Lord, I just pray the grace, your grace, Lord, would be with your people. The love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with all of us. And Lord, I pray that you'll, as we go out singing joy to the world, I pray that you'll bless us, you'll keep us this week, you'll watch over us on the road. You'll, Lord, just, just let, the, let the, the Spirit of God just be so strong in our hearts. The love of Jesus, Lord, knowing that you're there, that you showed up for us, let that be who we are all week, thinking about you thinking about what you mean in our lives. And Lord, may we not keep it here, but may we take it to our neighbor, may we take it to our workplace, may we take it to the nations. In Jesus' mighty name, Lord, there is truly joy to the world, and we're going to sing that joy right now as we go forth. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hallelujah. Let's sing it out, church. You want to stand and rise, let's give a praise today. Come on. Joy to the world. Hallelujah. Thank you. Awesome Christmas, and we'll see you Saturday night for New Year's Eve.